Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are joining us. We're uh, very happy uh, to have you here with us. Um, excited to host this uh, live webinar. Uh, joining uh, and hosting this event are uh, Sai and Srini. Both of them are lead consultants at ThoughtWorks and uh, very active contributors to uh, the open source community. So uh, we as Test Project, a uh, completely free test automation platform based on top of open source, are very excited to have such great contributors joining us and hosting this wonderful uh, webinar about contract testing. They actually just released um, a complete uh, tutorial to consumer-driven contract testing at our blog uh, which i will share the link in the chat uh, for you all to uh, have a look as well uh, and i guess uh, without uh, further ado i'll go ahead and um, give the stage to you guys and uh, of course uh, for anyone interested we will share the recording of this event um, a couple of hours uh, once we complete this so uh, i guess uh, uh let's get started cool thanks karen uh thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and i hope everyone's safe and sound there on the other side so let's get started uh, with a, a, a slight introduction about me and srini uh, karen already pretty much mentioned uh, so, yeah, I've been working with ThoughtWorks as a lead consultant for about uh, five years now, and I've been a QA for about roughly nine to 10 years. Uh, and I'm very passionate about um, open source contribution. Um, so I give back to the community on my learnings. Um, so I've contributed to a couple of uh, uh, repositories where uh, active contributor to Appium, I've contributed to Selenium, and a few other tools where me and Srini paired together and we felt uh, this should be open sourced, uh, which could uh, help everyone in the community, which is ATD, which is APM test distribution, to run your Android and iOS test in parallel. And uh, uh, they, and we're also active contributors to Tyco, uh, which is uh, an open source uh, a browser automation tool by uh, ThoughtWorks. Yeah, that's about me. Thanks, Sorry. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. So myself, uh, Srinivasan Shekhar, uh, APM member, uh, Appium committer, Selenium contributor. Uh, I've presented uh, quite a lot of topics on different uh, international conferences, uh, blogger as well. So that's pretty much myself. Yeah. So, so before we go uh, in depth about uh, consumer driven contract testing and how we can implement it using different tools, so let's start with. Uh, how monolith, or what is monolithic architecture, what is microservices, how they are different between each other. So I'm not here to open a debate between monolith versus microservices. There are a lot of wonderful blogs that debates about uh, monolith versus microservices. So let's start with uh, monolith architecture. So monolith architecture is uh, is built there for quite a while. So it's built as a single log system. That is, uh, it takes everything in single code base, uh, monolith is often deployed at once. Uh, I mean, both the front end and uh, uh, front end code and back end code, uh, regardless of whatever has changed, uh, whichever functionality changed, we bundle everything together and then deploy it, uh, everything together. In terms of microservices, it's a suite of uh, smaller services, wherein uh, each has uh, its own code bases, and in a, uh, in a proper architecture, uh, microservices has micro front ends as well, and also in micro databases. So that we call as bubble pattern. And uh, in terms of microservices, uh, uh, the scalability of microservices is all about uh, uh, by distributing these microservices across multiple servers, replicating as needed. But in terms of monoliths, monoliths are all about uh, scaling by replicating the monolith uh, on multiple servers. So uh, if there is any small changes in the microservice, we go to that particular microservice. Uh, if there is any change in the system that we need, uh, that might have, uh, that might need to deliver the value to a customer, we go to that particular microservices, do the development, testing, and everything. Uh, I mean, we bundle the, uh, I mean, we build that microservice and then deploy it standalone. 
so uh, that's the difference between monolith and uh, microservices all together so we can switch to uh, 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 we can take a sample application and then take uh, uh, how does it uh, looks like for example if we take a simple e-commerce application so this is uh, pictureized as uh, quite complex yes uh, for uh, for an end user it looks quite simple because the user interface has a search page and we do uh, cart uh, we add it to the add the product to cart and then do a payment so it has quite a lot of microservices and other hooks for example uh, user information has been uh, served through a user service uh, search takes care, search microservice takes care of uh, everything related to search uh, searching a product or everything related to search and payment service to do the payment and uh, not just that once uh, a customer purchased the product in terms of delivering the product so sending you the notification where exactly the product is at present everything is driven under the hood by different microservices so so a, a typical e-commerce application might have uh, plenty of microservices and uh, several teams so we will take a look at one of the smaller piece and uh, smaller portion in this uh, image so if we uh, in this complex system if we take the smaller portion out there there is a jar that takes the input as a ball and do some operation and uh, sends the uh, sends the same ball to different other team so uh, if it take if it take a real world story uh, probably an atlassian story uh, they have two services one is a payment service and that talks to uh, a user service where an user service is uh, one who can provide uh, user related information for the credit card and so to payment service so um, these two microservices been owned by different two different teams hope you all are able to hear me sai can you hear me oh uh, yeah uh, what was the question no no uh, uh, i switched out from the microphone so so these two microservices are owned by different teams so payment team has to uh, contact a different team basically their user team who takes care of uh, uh, building the user microservices so it's been going well in the production for quite some time so payment team gets the information from i mean payment service gets the information from user service uh, uh, on what the what the user information that they need but uh, after a period of time payment team uh, sorry uh, user inter user service team has done some rearchitecture and then some refactoring together so they uh, accidentally changed a user uh, i mean accidentally changed one key which was uh, actually consumed by payment service for quite some time so the user keyword changed to users keyword uh, it was changed accidentally so uh, they went live without any communication with the uh, payment team and that broken the payment uh, payment altogether in the production so um, so uh, if there is any if there is very less communication between these two teams uh, or uh, or if a provider or uh, as a user microservice if i don't know how my consumers are consuming me it will become very difficult to understand how the microservices evolves because over a period of time we might have n number of consumers uh, one such here listed is a payment there might be other consumers who might be consuming the information from uh, user service so this might result in uh, if there is very less tests and if there is um, if if there is less communication usually this breaks down things in production so how we can avoid this altogether so basically one way or a better way to avoid this is uh having a good number of tests and plenty of tests are done and uh, we will see how uh, how and where we need to exactly write tests so one of the typical uh, approach that we took up is the test permit uh, test permit will have uh, different layers in it and uh, uh, this is one of the example of a typical test permit we have a ui uh, on the tip of the permit where we wrote the very less test for the ui and we have a service layer in between where we wrote all the service related test and we have unit tests as well on the output whereas uh, we wrote um, plenty of unit test and uh, the in detail typical test permit will definitely look like this and uh, there are different uh, evolution of this test permit let's not debate about uh, whether test permit still holds true on this case or it on or it doesn't hold true at all so uh, irrespective of uh, whichever style that we
we have picked up. So these players of the Pramit still relevant. Like uh, having a large number of unit tests matters a lot because if you have tests as close to your developer code base as possible, it helps us to give faster feedbacks and it's less costlier as well. So we don't need to deploy the code and test it and then get the feedback. Okay, once again, do the changes, test it on local and then uh, build it in CI and then deploy it. Okay, again, wait for another feedback. So that's the advantage of having the tests as close to as uh, developers code base as possible. Will give us faster feedbacks and also, uh, which is less costlier as well. Otherwise, uh, as we grow on the tip of the pyramid, uh, finding something as a bug will again cost a lot. So um, let's quickly see uh, how, uh, uh, so these are the layers of Pramid and we will see how uh, these layers of Pramid is quite applicable over here, what we are talking about. Yeah. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so, so like uh, the way Steeny mentioned over here uh, about uh, the different layers in the pyramid, so the lowest layer is our unit, right? So basically when you take the unit test, they typically uh, always mock. So we basically have mock dependencies. For example, the story with Srini, uh, you know, mentioned about the payment service and the user service, right? So if the payment service is actually uh, building something, so now they're going to actually mock the user service. Uh, that, that's exactly how it works in the unit test world, right? So we have a payment service which makes a request to the mocked user service. And the mock user service intent, uh, you know, gives a response to the payment service. And the payment service, they typically go ahead, uh, write the unit test, do some sort of assertions and, and all of that, all, all the stuff, what they want to do with the unit test. So what are the, so basically the unit tests are nothing but the mock dependency, the mock test. So what are these mock tests are actually? So basically the mock tests are targeted because they don't go flaky uh, because they're pointed to a single system. Uh, and we know that uh, which is that system, like the payment service is pointing to the uh, user service, the mock user service. And if they fail, we know exactly uh, the reason for the failure and uh, and, and and the test uh, which had actually failed. And uh, they are very cheap to maintain and write tests in isolation. And they do not de depend on any external systems because you really don't need an external system to be spun up, uh, you know, make some configurations and stuff. They all are purely mocked and and uh, that specific microservice has control about all the all the uh, mocked uh, services. So which means you can also, um, you know, set up some sort of mock data the way you need and don't rely on any other system. And saying that the, the, these tests are, are, are like very fast uh, because these these tests run fast and they allow the devs or, or the team to get a faster feedback uh, in, the, in the cycle when they change any piece of code, they're doing some sort of refactoring or some, some voice code rolling at, at the time of development. Um, so they could actually run them and it's, and it's pretty fast uh, on, the, on the mock unit layers. But these tests are not trustworthy. Oh, why? Right? Because these tests actually, they run against the mock environments and they do not know if any changes occur to the external service, like the user service, right? Which they change from user to users. Makes sense, the user was an array, but yeah, and they had to rename it to users. Uh, so similar way here, they wouldn't know such changes because they are completely mocked on the, on the, on the other microservice side, which is the payment over here, right? And uh, you know, when these tests actually fail, uh, the developers could also change them. I, I've seen that happening, uh, something failed and the developers actually go ahead and change these and they get them green. And uh, these tests basically, they, they run against a lot of, uh, you know, assumptions being uh, made. So, yeah, but if we say that, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, we want to write more more tests and we say if it's not trustworthy. So Srini, what could be another way that we could actually look at? Because when, when we hear the term not trustworthy, I mean, we don't want to, you know, stick to that level, right? So what could be another way or another an, another step for us to like uh, solve this problem? So from an application point of view, uh, in terms of stability, if we say uh, unit tests are not that trustworthy, I would lay, move one layer up in the promade and write uh, integration test as the name suggests integration over here is about uh, integration uh, integrating several developed modules separately into uh, a single system and test it on a single place uh, that is basically the integration environment that we can talk to multiple stakeholders when i say uh, multiple stakeholders if a, an application has plenty of uh, microservices we have to go to each and every microservice team uh, uh, each and every team who owns a microservice talk to them ask them to deploy 
uh, everything uh, i mean uh, deploy the stable applications in their uh, uh, integration environment and then writing an integration system level integration test not the local integration test where we mock the external file test basically what i'm talking about is a system level integration test whereas uh, uh, we can trust that because uh, we are talking about the real service we are not going to mock any of the dependencies that we are talking to so basically as a payment service team i can talk to user service team and then ask them to deploy the actual user service and test everything on the integration environment as again and see how does my application behaves it's trustworthy but uh, is it is it faster enough no it's completely slow because we have to talk to multiple different uh, we have to talk to multiple teams who owns these microservices and then we have to come into the conclusion to deploy everything into a single environment where the other microservices might be stable or might not be stable is something that we are not aware of but uh, but we can one thing we can we can surely say is uh, this system level integration test when we have plenty of microservices is going to be slow and will it be stable no there are chances that some of the microservices might not might be flaky and it might return as a uh, 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 timeouts it might be due to network issues or it might be due to an application needs to itself in the different microservices so there are chances that it might be highly brittle because uh, it talks to multiple microservices and uh, due to network or due to the application issue itself the test might be flaky and we need to start rerunning it and then make sure that uh, our tests are passing in uh, passing for uh, payment service so that we can deploy the payment service into production so if there is an issue then we need to go ahead figure out uh, whose fault is it whether it's an application issue on our side whether it's a user service issue at their side or it's going to be a ball game between the between the teams so we have to figure out the fault and then we have to uh, fix it if there is an application issue we need to fix it and then deploy it once again and so again this process continues till we uh, make the ca pipeline doing so that we can go to production yeah as i said it's trustworthy but still it's slow brittle and again we have to figure out if there is anything goes wrong we have to figure out whose fault it is so that's about the the score of integration test so if uh, so, the problem continues then who will solve it so shrini if you're saying that the integration tests are trustworthy but like i said the mocks are not trustworthy and if we move to the a step up and if we say the integration tests are you know trustworthy but they're slow brittle i don't want to keep rerunning my pipeline you know uh, red and red and then green and and not know why the build actually turned green from a from two consecutive reds right uh, so basically even in that case i really wouldn't Uh, you know trust my ci pipeline in such case so so what could so how do we solve this right so what what so what comes into play now so uh, uh, since we know that integration tests are not uh, trustworthy though but uh, not sl it's slow brittle so that's when uh, consumer driven contract test comes into picture to resolve these problems basically avoid the problems between two microservices that talks to each other uh, i mean the basically uh, the microservices that communicates between uh between two entities and the main idea behind is a uh, consumer driven contract test is about uh, formalizing these interactions between consumer and provider here in our case it's the payment service and payment service team and the user service team so consumer as a consumer which is the payment service team creates a, a, an agreement uh, between them i mean between uh, payment service and user service the agreement usually holds the interactions between these two teams uh, which is uh, what kind of expectations they have i mean the payment service have on the user service uh, response and the request and uh, uh, once the agreement is ready from the consumer point of view they share it with the provider and provider has to agree that uh, contracts so basically they extract the information from the agreement and uh, test to verify whether the they stick to their agreements uh, what they made initially with the consumer team so that's about the consumer driven contract is uh, that's the main goal of our main idea of the consumer driven contract test are there any specific like sort of tools frameworks that we could use to sort of uh, start writing a consumer driven contract soon yes there are uh, uh, plenty of uh, tools available in market to implement this consumer driven contract test the one we picked up is pact and uh, uh, this consumer driven contract test are basically uh, going to be faster and also uh, Uh, and also it's going to be running on the local because consumer writes a test 
and runs it on local, generates a file and then gives it to provider and provider runs their own test and it runs on their own machine on local. So basically, uh, Pact helps us to write a test on consumer and it's going to run on the consumer's, uh, I mean, consumer side and then they're going to generate an agreement file, share it with provider and provider also going to run that test. So basically, it's going to be, uh, since it's going to be on local, so it's going to be fast and uh, it's not going to be brittle as well. So that's how Pact works. And uh, uh, there are other tools as well that we have discussed about uh, Spring Cloud Contract also in one of our blogs that we have uh, written in the series. Uh, and we have picked up Pact for today here. And uh, uh, let's go and see how does the Pact work. So, uh, the two teams, the payment service and the user service, gonna come up with an agreement. Uh, basically, they're gonna interact with each other and then come up with an agreement. And this agreement will have an expected request describing what a payment service is expecting from a consumer, which is, I mean, program provider, which is the uh, user service. So, and uh, also it will, the interaction will also have what is expected as a response as well. So what kind of request and what kind of response expected. So uh, user service might have n number of uh, n number of consumers. One of that is a uh, payment service. So uh, payment service will have the minimum expected response from, uh, I mean, describe the minimum expected response they expect from uh, uh, actual provider. So this is how the pact works. Let's uh, see how, uh, or who would actually implement uh, these kind of tests. So the consumer team has a responsibility of uh, uh, defining this contract. I mean, basically defining this interaction with, uh, okay, this is how the, uh, this is gonna be a get method. This is how the request will look like. And this is how the response will look like. And they write a test on consumer side, which is basically on the consumer code base itself. So once they execute the test, it generates a packed file, which is the contract file. And this contract file will hold all the informations of the request and the response. I mean, the minimum expected response. They will share the same with the provider team. So now provider team, which is the payment service, I mean, the uh, user service team has the contract and they extract the information from the contract and run the test against the actual service, which is the user service itself. So uh, they will verify whether the uh, expectations that they are initially agreed between these two teams are well and good by running the test against the actual service. So both the teams are uh, act, act, shares the responsibility and they collaborate and communicate about their API usage. And here from uh, this point of view, provider also has a, a good visibility on who are all my consumers and how they are consuming me. This helps them to evolve in a much uh, stable way. So without breaking any of the consumers. So that's how uh, Pact will, uh, that's how the responsibility of uh, uh, test being shared between provider and the consumer. Cool, and there are plenty of clients available for provider, uh, I mean, uh, for Pact. So consider for an example, um, payment service is de uh, developed on a Node.js, whereas user service is developed on a Spring Boot Java. So in such case, the payment service team, which is the consumer team, uh, they write the test using packed JS client, whereas the uh, user service team writes the test against a, a Java client of Pact. So, uh, so Pact provides a wide variety of clients. One is Java client and uh, JS clients. They have clients on Swift, Ruby, Go, and Python as well. Okay. So now, like, uh, like the way Srini mentioned about these different specific uh, tools. So let's go ahead and see what exactly or how these contract testings are being implemented, right? So the like, like Srini said, consumer is the one who's responsible to sort of create the contract and share it with the provider. Okay. So over here, if you see, it's the consumer uh, who who create who spins up a, a provider mock. That's nothing but uh, the provider mock is being spun up by uh, Pact. So Pact itself gives us a mock server here. Okay, and they spin up a, a mock server and uh, they create a contract. Okay, who creates the contract? Is the consumer who creates the contract? And what does the contract actually hold? It's it's a sort of file. We'll we'll take a look at it. What they actually hold. So basically, uh, the contract is going to hold all the requests what is being made by the consumer. Uh, so the consumer, let's say the provider has got about uh, 
maybe uh, 10 endpoints, whether it's a post get or whatever so that could be. And uh, the consumer is consuming few of them. So the packed file, the contract file will actually have that specific request uh, and what sort of response they're expecting from that request. And uh, once the uh, file has been created by the consumer, that has been shared to the provider. And now what the provider would do is, the provider needs to verify it, right? And what do they verify with? So like I said, the contract file is actually uh, got the specific request and the responses. So the provider would actually get all the data from the contract file and they would make requests to their actual provider API, not mock, actual provider API, and they would get the response out from it. Uh, and they're gonna check the response with the response which is there in the contract file. Okay, uh, so that's how the provider would know, okay, this is the consumer and this consumer is using such an endpoint uh, from me and they are actually expecting uh, a specific uh, output. Now, uh, let's take this case over here where uh, the, the consumer is actually still using user, like the payment service is using a field called user uh, and that gets into the contract and the contract is being shared uh, to, the pro uh, to the provider, okay? But the provider has changed it to users now, okay? Now what happens is uh, the provider verifier will take the content from the contract file and make a request to the producer. And the producer will, fa will fail now uh, because they have changed user to users and they no longer understand what is user now. That way the provider would fail and stop their deployment uh, and they would know that which consumer they're breaking and that's when like they go back to the consumer saying, hey, we changed uh, from user to users. That is intentional. Uh, so you have to change it. We got a deprecate or whatever the process could be in that case. Okay. And uh, on the consumer side, what happens, like I said, so that's going to be the consumer client now, which is making a request to uh, the packed uh, mock server, which is the which is the post service. Okay. And that is going to, you know, sort of generate a file. And, and that will also go, it's going to respond back with your, uh, specific uh, re uh, response out of it. Okay, so the consumer spins up the pack mock uh, as a provider, uh, and then it creates the file, and the file will have all the sort of uh, interactions which the pack can actually understand. And uh, so that's like a sample code snippet. We'll go look into it in detail. So basically, here what we're trying to do is we're creating a packed object saying that, okay, this is my consumer name, this is my provider name, and uh, you got to run the mock server uh, in a specific port number and where you want to store these packs, pack files and stuff. Okay, and that's how your uh, interactions will look like. Uh, the interactions are nothing but, uh, so this is exactly what is going to get into your uh, packed file, okay? That's the contract file. So interactions are nothing but you actually tell, hey, I'm going to use a get uh, with a slash post list uh, that's going to be the header and then i'm expecting this response so you you actually write a test this way uh, uh, and this would create a packed file for you and then we'll share the packed file to the uh, provider okay and what the provider would do now is they have the packed file so they're going to pick the packed file and from the packed file uh, what packjs would do is it's going to get the list of interactions what they have and, and it's going to make a call to the actual provider service and the provider service is going to respond back uh, to that request, okay? Uh, when I say it's an actual service, it's not a mock service, it's an actual service which is actually running in the air local or, or so, okay? And that actually uh, returns back a response. And once we get the response out and that response is being fetched and what PAC would do is it could read that response and compare it with the PAC file. And if they both match, uh, they go green. If they don't match, they go red, okay? So what we'll do is we will go ahead and sort of uh, quickly uh, see some live demo of how stuffs work uh, in your in your CI pipeline. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, like look at it now. Uh, so I've actually created a very simple application, like a like like a very very simple uh, uh, API. Um, so that's got like a valid date. Okay. So basically what that's going to do is from a provider side, uh, it is going to, let me quickly uh, run through. Uh, provider. Uh, yeah. So that's running the provider application now. And now when you curl it, 
Okay, so that gives you this output. So that's the endpoint. It says provider valid date and the date. Okay. So now what's going to happen over here? Now what's going to happen in this case over here is uh, the consumer is going to consume this endpoint. Okay, and they're going to take this response out and they're going to marshal and build their own stuff. Okay, so that's what the consumer is actually going to do. So let's go ahead and see how the consumer uh, test would actually look like. Okay. So that's the packed. That's the packed uh, object. So that's the date consumer, and it says the provider name is a valid provider, and the mock port, mock server, and all of that. Okay. And then we set it up. So the provider setup would actually uh, spun up the uh, server for us, and then you add an interaction to it. Okay. And what is an interaction? In my case, I've written two test cases. One is a valid case for a you know provided a valid date, it should say yes. You provided an invalid date or a null date, which is a valid date is required. Okay. So what would the uh, interactions hold? The interaction will hold with request. So I'm going to use a get with this endpoint. This as a data query, as a query, and uh, I'm expecting you as a provider to return me a status 200 uh, with a header and an expected body. Okay. So the expected body will have like test valid date in terms of so that basically has few matches. Okay. So what these matches would actually uh, sort of do is uh, they they say okay it's like it's term and and certain stuff. Similar way for an invalid date, uh, we say okay hey you got to return me a, a 400 and, and and things. Okay. So and uh, and other stuff is this. So let's go now and sort of uh, quickly uh, uh, run this test. Okay. So I'm gonna run uh, contract service pack. So this is going to exactly run that test and this has to create a, a packed a file for us with all those interactions and, and other things. Okay. Uh, oh, my server is running. I think there's a port config. Okay. It's good to show actually in the pipeline. I've actually set up a pipeline itself for this. So we have a Docker file. So we have created this Docker file. You can find this entire repo and this Docker files in, in the blogs. They're being tagged to the respective uh, chapters. So we have a Postgres, Docker, uh, image, a packed broker, and a Jenkins, okay? Uh, and uh, we have slightly built a Jenkins with a packed broker client. Uh, I will talk to you uh, what exactly is this packed broker client when we look at the uh, pipeline. Uh, so let's go. So when I hit uh, localhost 8080, I should see my Jenkins running. And when I say localhost 8282, I should see my packed broker over here, okay? So I'm going to delete some stuff here so that we could start it off again. Okay. And now if we see um, over here, so this basically is exactly the same code in the pipeline, which is going to check out, run some NPM install. Uh, so that's going to run your consumer test and uh, that will actually generate a pack file for you. And we're going to push that pack file to pack broker. So basically, uh, let's look at what exactly the test is doing over there, right? In the in the in the packed publish. So you have the packed file created now, but there has to be a, a way that you want to share this packed file, right? To the pro, to the provider. Uh, so how do you share it? I mean, you can't share it through emails and stuff. So pretty, typically, there's no versioning. You don't know what exactly is happening. So packed has got something called as packed broker, okay? And through the packed broker, you can actually share these files. Uh, and uh, both the entities can actually look into what the statuses are and they can check what is the result and all of that stuff. Okay. So, so that's one of the sample which is already present uh, in, in, the, in the pack broker default container. So that brings up with uh, a, a sample example for you and all of that stuff. So that could have created the file for us now, and this will publish the file into the pack broker. Okay. Uh, look at that. So we got an entry over here, which published the file. So which is nothing but the contract now. Okay. So this says, uh, hey, uh, there's a get, uh, and uh, the contract says it's a provider valid date. So this is exactly how we wrote the test, right? Which was a part of our interaction in, in this case. And then we say, this is what uh, we are expecting, which is a, a standard status code 200 and a content type should hold this. And the response body should hold this, 
okay similar way for an invalid date uh, we are expecting an error which is you know valid date is required and the status to be uh, 400 okay so now uh, let's go ahead yeah we will come back on why the deploy is failing okay so that is something which we want to uh, look into in the next step so now the provider you know is going to run their test which is a provider verifier test and what this is going to do is these tests basically are going to talk to the pact broker okay so this is the one one fancy line that does the magic you say new verifier verify options and options so in the options you basically tell what's the pack broker url uh, what's the provider what's the consumer version number tags and there are a lot of options you can look into their documentation okay so this one test is going to uh, you know hit the pack broker uh, with the url which is provided if you have credentials mine is localhost so typically i don't have any there uh, so this is going to fetch the pack uh, you know pack file from from there and it's going to run the test and if it's all good it's going to publish the results back to pack broker okay uh let's see where is our pack broker now okay cool so now we go back over here and when we uh, see our test you see it says last verified is uh, one minute okay so what does that mean is now the now the broker the now the provider has actually picked the contract from here and they have ran their test in their pipeline and everything is good as per what was agreed and then it pushes the result right and now there should be a way where the where the consumer should know that hey the provider has given me a go green so i can go ahead and deploy right so that is where uh, you know so that's where there is this client which uh, pack provides is called pack broker client okay so what basically this pack broker client would do is they have a cli command which is can i deploy okay and what would that can i deploy do is so let's see this failure what happened over here okay so the for the first time when we ran it actually failed because it says it's the, so it's asking pack broker can i deploy this specific consumer version to the next environment okay and pack broker immediately fails saying that hey i do not have a verified version of results so i would say no okay but now when we run it the next time, so next time when the consumer runs it, okay, it, it, this should go green because the provider has published a result to the uh, pack broker, okay. So the new uh, version of Pact Broker, which uh, the Pact Foundation has, is called Pact Flow. You can go ahead and check out Pact Flow, uh, how it works, and it's really cool. You should definitely look at it. Okay, so it's it's green now. Okay, so let's go into the dip. Uh, oh, sorry, not build now. Uh, the previous uh, success, and see now what does that can I deploy say? Right? Hey, we asked the Pact Broker. Hey, can I deploy the specific? Uh, you know, I'm the consumer. Can you check with the provider if they verified it? Okay, with the latest build. So it says, oh yeah, the provider has verified it's a success true and the computer says yes, okay. So which means the build is green. Uh, it's, it's, it's a go green for us. So you could go ahead and sort of deploy them, okay. And now what happens if uh, the consumer changes something, right? Let's say, sorry, the provider changes something out on their side. For example, if the provider is saying, um, you know, I'm changing all the status codes from 404 to, you know, 400 to 404, okay. Just just for argument's sake, for us to understand what exactly is happening. So they said, okay, we're changing this. And now what is going to happen is the provider uh, has to sort of, uh, when they run the test, they should fail. Why they should fail? We will take a look at it, right? So let's run the provider test. What's the file name? Provider factory upgrade. Okay.
Sorry, let's check that in uh, package, yeah. Jason. Okay, uh, there is one actually, so we could use that. Um, okay, um, I think I have some local changes. Okay, so it, it passes in this case. Now I'm gonna uh, sort of change that uh, to a 404. Okay. And now it should actually fail. Ah, no. On the, on the wrong branch, I believe. And the contract problem. Ah, this will probably decide. Yeah. Well, let's get into, uh, I, I want to show you the negative cases as well. Maybe you can regenerate the packed file inside. Oh yeah, the pack does not happen actually. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. cool. So now we run this. So it typically failed here because uh, it says expected was a 400, but we got a 404, right? And where is this expect coming from? The expect is coming from uh, the packed file from here, which the consumer created, okay? And now the provider is like, oh, I broke something and the provider would know exactly who they broke actually. So now if you go back to the packed broker uh, in your pipeline, uh, in your packed broker here. So this basically when it fails, uh, it would actually publish the results as well uh, from the CI. I've just turned it off locally, but from your CI, it would publish the results as well, uh, where you could actually go ahead and, uh, and and see that. We could we could do that as well uh, to see how we publish the results to the pack broker. Okay, uh, pack broker base URL. I'm gonna change this to uh, the one which is running in my local. Okay, uh, so we could run the uh, same command again. That's the one. There you go. So it failed. And then we go back to, we go back to the pack broker. There you see, it actually is failed it here. And now when the consumer goes and says, hey, can I deploy? It's gonna say, hey, you know, you can't deploy uh, because uh, yeah, the, the pack broker says that the provider is broken something but if you're interested to know what exactly uh, they have failed you could also get in here to the provider that will have a lot of details uh, which version and, and all of that stuff you could go ahead and play around with the pack broker uh, that, that's a lot more all right okay cool uh, yeah so uh, as you all seen uh, sai once started the consumer test for the first time uh, it generated the json file and uh, uploaded the same to pack broker but it stopped the deployment because a publisher has i mean the provider hasn't executed uh, the same tests and verified that the contract file because can i deploy is the command that stopped the deployment cycle so uh, as a payment team and uh, use the service team if we are in a distributed architecture uh, every time when i change the contract i can't ask them to uh, run the pipeline and then wait for it because uh, 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 it, it does delays the process actually. So we, in a continuous integration cycle, we wanted everything to be continuous. So uh, what happens in terms of, uh, in terms if there is a change in contract, so contract will get published in pack broker. So we can also create a webhook that kind of notifies the provider CI, uh, I mean the provider CI pipeline, uh, where the actual provider service tests are running. So it fetches the contract, verifies it, and then publishes the result back to back to broker automatically. 
and once the results are in we can also create another webhook that can again notify back to consumer that we are now good to deploy now so uh, we can create a webhook in pact broker to for different operations one of that is to uh, uh, have this notification process so uh, automatically con by configuring the provider ca uh, url we can automatically notify trigger um, the provider pipelines and then get the results back and ask the consumer i mean it automatically triggers the consumer to deploy as well another advantage in having this packed broker is it gives us a visual representation of uh, how how my consumers are consuming uh and what data they are exactly consuming from the user service for example so this is uh, another uh, uh, visual diagram saying uh, okay this consumer uh, there are these are this many consumers for this microservice and how they if i click on each line it gives us the interactions between these two entities for example service 17 is being consumed by service 16 so if I click on that line, it gives me an interaction between service 16 and 17, which has all the details between, I mean, all the data, I mean, all the contracts between service 16 and service 17. This helps us to understand when there is a new requirement comes in place and if you wanted to do some refactoring and this helps us to understand who are all the consumers that will get impacted if I change this. So if I have all this, uh, who are all the consumers will get impacted. If none of my consumers consuming a particular data key, does it still make sense to send it to as a response? So these are the decisions that can be taken when we have a visual representations of how my consumers are consuming and what they are exactly consuming as well. So that's about this uh, this diagram and uh, uh, Pact also, as uh, Sai said, uh, Sai showed that the Pact will also, uh, I mean, the Pact broker will also uh, notify if there is uh, any failure using can I deploy? If there is any failure, it stops the deployment as well. So, yeah, as you see here, the webhook status is read and uh, the not, not run on the Android app, it's clearly saying that uh, there is a webhook created, but uh, we didn't, it, get, it, it didn't trigger the uh, provider pipeline yet. I mean, there is no new commits came in that they can trigger the provider pipeline yet. So that's about the pack broker. The main idea behind the consumer driven contract test is to have this uh, communication between uh, a consumer and provider formalized. So that uh, uh, verify both the services stick to the contract and what they have actually agreed upon. So that is the main idea between uh, having a consumer driven contract test. And also rather than waiting for user service to deploy it in a deploy integration environment, they can write uh, tests on their, uh, I mean, they can write tests uh, individually and that can be run on local for consumer and that can be run on local for provider. And these tests are, uh, since these tests are running in local and it's going to be fast, robust. Yeah, that's the main idea behind having the consumer driven contract tests. Well, and we have uh, also published uh, a blog series which uh, uh, talks about uh, um, consumer driven contract tests using Spring Cloud contracts. And uh, we also have a blog on uh, how does the consumer driven contract testing can be done when we have a, a streaming system in between like a Kafka or a PubSub. So uh, this helps, uh, I hope this helps you people to understand uh, how we can implement consumer driven contract testing when we have any message queues or any, any other uh, streaming services in plans and uh, uh, the details about how we can create a web book and how we can actually trigger the Jenkins pipeline of provider automatically is something that's been covered already in uh, integration. Uh, I mean, integrating this contract testing in build pipeline blog, blog as well. So that's about consumer driven contracts. Cool. So we have some cool stuff as well happening is uh, there are some, uh, some, I'm sure you've seen this in the link as well. So you, so you could also win some cool goodies. So follow test project. Uh, uh, you know you can create LinkedIn posts uh, with your post how, how the how the session went or once you read the blog how the blog sounds and add a hashtag for test project and the Srini and Sai contract testing fun. Um, and I think if I'm not wrong, this closes on 16th. So go ahead, start tweeting, write, start writing posts on LinkedIn if you want to really win some cool tweets. 
and feel free to share your feedbacks uh, feel free to share your experiences of using uh, or implementing a consumer driven contract test on your projects absolutely yeah. and thank you very much for uh, joining us today uh, thank you thank you uh, thank you thank you science sweeney for this uh, wonderful uh, webinar i see we have a couple of uh, questions in the q and a section uh if uh, you'd like to address those if we have a couple more minutes yep. and for everyone uh, regarding the prizes i sent in the chat links to uh, the test project uh, linkedin um, profile as well as science Sweeney's. so just go ahead and follow those and uh, write about your experience or what you enjoyed most about this webinar today about contract testing and uh, we'll be announcing the winners uh, in uh, two days. Good. So I'll uh, just open the Q&A. Uh, so I'm seeing, do you really need a pack broker if both the teams are within the same organization? And what is the benefit in this case? Uh, yes, I would say yes. So I can give an example uh, where within an organization, we had about, uh, we had multiple uh, teams and they all were different microservices. Uh, roughly, if I have to count, maybe we had close to about 80 to 90 microservices, means tiny, tiny teams building uh, multiple uh, microservices. Uh, and we had, so we, and we used Packbroker to sort of uh, independently deploy and take care of our CI pipelines when we want to go production and stuff. Yes, it is. The only need I have not seen the need for a Packbroker is if your own team, that's your team A, your own team is being the consumer and the provider for the service. Let's say you are the one who's building the service and you're the one who's consuming the service as well. In that case, I don't see a need to use a pack broker, but definitely if there are multiple teams within the organization, you should use pack broker. That gives you uh, the entire CI workflow flexibility to go, you, to go CI CD. Uh, what type of main... Yeah, Shini, go ahead. You want to pick another one? Needs, can it be written in Java? So uh, in terms of maintenance, it's about uh, uh, as and when the consumer, I mean, the consumer evolves, like consider a payment service wants some more information. So they have to add a new interaction, uh, which is, uh, uh, it will automatically generate a, a new PAX file that will get published. So this is, a, uh, this is about the maintenance and uh, uh, anyways, uh, this practice doesn't worry about the data because we are gonna check only the uh, data types, not the data, exact data. So that's about uh, maintenance. Can it be written in Java? Yes. Uh, so PACT has uh, quite a lot of clients on different programming languages. So we can obviously use uh, any of the PACT clients. And uh, I would suggest to use the clients, uh, I mean the client programming language as close to uh, developer code base as possible. So if developer uses uh, JS, I would prefer to use uh, JS client of PACT. Uh, how can I implement consumer driven contract testing for Salesforce projects? Can you share some use cases? Mm, for Salesforce projects, Shini, I'm not sure what, what this question is. Do you want to take this or maybe we can take it offline if we can, if Subashis can like sort of connect uh, over LinkedIn or Twitter to us. Yes. And Karen, do we have more time left? Uh, yeah, we have time for uh, one one last question, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, can we use PACT for functional testing of APIs or you still have to use some other tool? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Uh, yes, yeah, so PACT is basically for your consumer-driven contracts. So do not bring PACT for your functional testing of APIs. That's completely a whole different concept of consumer driven contract testing and functional testing. So yeah, go ahead and use functional testing for use any other tool for your functional testing. They are two different stuff. Functional testing is completely different. Consumer driven contracts are completely different. Cool. Right. And if, if we haven't answered any of the questions, maybe we can, we can get the questions from Karen and probably uh, give it back. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, we can uh, definitely uh, add those questions um, in LinkedIn and probably uh, post 
uh, and uh, tag you to to try and answer those as well. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your time and for joining us today. Uh, I hope you all uh, stay safe out there. And uh, thank you, uh, Sai and Srini, for this wonderful uh, webinar and uh, live demo. This, this was wonderful. And I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. And stay tuned for more uh, webinars we have coming soon, uh, one that's coming up uh, next week even about uh, Docker and uh, Jenkins workshop with uh, Anand uh, Bhagawat. We'll be uh, sharing more about that as well. So make sure to stay tuned and uh, we're looking forward to seeing your contract testing posts online. So um, we'll be following those. And of course, you will all receive a recording of the, of the full webinar in a couple of hours. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you thank all you. for joining. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Bye-bye.